Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage Vault Series. The Vault Series is a series of interviews that we shot starting back in 2004, two years before the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum opened to the public. If you like what you see, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Thanks for watching. Today's guest was voted the BMI Songwriter of the Century, produced the biggest country record of all time, He Stopped Loving Her Today, and wrote and produced Tammy Wynette's Stand By Your Man, Billy Sherrill. George Jones, the possum. He entered my life because of Tammy. I, I, I had produced her, and unbeknownst to, to me, he had fallen in love with her. And he was on another label. And he said, so he called me and said, look, I'm trying to get off this label. I want to do a duet for Tammy. And if you, if you will sign me, I'll, will you sign me? I said, sure, of course I'll sign you. And so he finally got off the other label, came over and uh, they did duets, got married. Everything was rosy there for, for a while. And then we started uh, finding some good songs for George. He hadn't been selling a lot of records. But uh, a little thing that Bobby Braddock and Curly Puffman wrote called He Stopped Lover to Day Changed All That. So I stayed number one for about two months. Before that, though, my, I mean, The Door, um, The Grand Tour? Yeah, th they were country hits. Th this was like a like a mega thing. This, this, this was a career igniter, you know. I thought you did it again with him when it came out, because I, I, he was already, I would, I, most people considered him already to be the greatest country singer. And and then in 19, I guess it was 80, was it 80, 79 oh, I don't and then he, and then he just he got bigger than he ever was. Oh, he became like a cult figure and all that. Everybody liked him then, you know. Okay, here's another one. Um, but this time you had to wrestle the possum on this song. Oh, he hated it. The recording of this song was a nightmare. Bobby Braddock, Curly Puffman brought me the song over. And I didn't like the way they had the guy dying right up front. I said, can you rewrite it, you know? And uh, so they, I said, I think you're giving it away too quick. So they went back and they brought it. We, we, had, we went back and forth haggling about that song for a half dozen times. And finally they got it the way I thought it should be. Not that I, you know, know it all, but I knew what I thought was good. And so I said, Jones, George Jones, this is it for him. And so he came in. And back then, Jones was kind of, he was kind of messed up with his personal life. And, and, and so he came in, and he he didn't comment on it one way or the other. You know, I said, look, I'm going to go ahead and make a track. Let's figure out your key. and. And so he said, well, I, I can sing. So we, we went in there, and he, unlike Tammy, you know, unlike Marty Robbins, Jones was lazy. It took him forever. He, he wouldn't learn anything unless he just wanted to, you know. It's like trying to push a spaghetti, you know, push a rope along. And so I got his key, got a real good track, and he was messed up. His throat was messed up, so he couldn't, he couldn't sing it, so he left. Went off a... Of, for another month or so, doing his, doing his thing, came back in, and one day he came in, his voice was fairly good shape. He said, okay, I'm ready to go do that song. He'd been bugging me to do that song, so he went in there, and he said, he said, I love you till I die. I said, well, wait a minute, that's not the melody. He said, yeah, but it's a better melody than what was on that demo. I said, yeah, I'm sure Christopherson will think so too. That's Help me make it through the night. You're singing it to help me make it through the night. He said, "Oh, uh, well, it's still a better melody." I said, "Well, yeah, but we got we can't do it." And so finally, he came in one day and hooked it. He was in good shape. His voice was in good shape. And that's that's one of those you got to as soon as the first playback, you got to go to your office and put on an overcoat because you're freezing to death in goosebumps. 
And so I knew we had one to go. Anyway, we that had took to, a long time though. Didn't took it? a year from the time they played it to get Jones to sing it. Of all kind of haggling, hassling, and getting him to learn it. And, and uh, so he came in the office and I said, "I want you to hear something." I played him the finished song. He said, "Well, I hope you're right, but I'm saying here and now that." Nobody will buy that morbid song, bitch. I said, they may not buy it, Jones, but they're going to get their shot at it next week. So they released it, and it just exploded. Did he bet you $100 or something? Yeah, yeah, he bet me $100. Paid me, too. <laughs> so, um... I was going to say then. Yeah, you had a buddy killing moment. I did. <laughs> how did you make? How did you make buddy? I don't even remember. We just. But y'all had a great run together as producer publisher. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 Rick Hall and I would come up and play songs to Tree, and I'd play some to somebody, and, and Buddy would come by, and, and we just got to gradually knowing each other, you know. And then we came. I guess Buddy's my oldest, dearest friend. Is, is it true that you and Rick Hall used to sleep under a bridge? We had a car. We weren't like a troll. <laughs> we, we were in a car. We didn't have the money to get a hotel, so, you know, we pull in there, you know, and flip a coin to who gets the back seat. I just think it's good that people know that, that you don't start at the top. No. No, you don't. And there never really is a top, I don't think. I think people just keep trying it. Know, better themselves and learning stuff, you know. Um, do you remember uh, you told me something about Chet one time? I thought it was kind of funny when you first came. You got a meeting with Chet when you first got to town. You and somebody else had a Rick Hall. Hall. Was you and Hall? Rick Hall. Yeah. It, I wasn't all concerned. I mean, I, I was a little nervous about meeting Chet Atkins, you know, Chet Atkins. And, uh, so Rick came in and Rick played all, he did all the talking and I just sort of sat on the sideline and uh, Chet said, okay, I'll, I'll hold on to a couple of these. I, I, I can't give you any promises. And it's, you know, it's kind of a short meeting, it's very am, am, amicable, you know, Chet, nice. And so we left and Rick, all, Rick said, you know, I was a nervous Rick. I said, well, you acted kind of nervous a little bit. He said, no. I was a nervous wreck. He said, I had this vision in my mind that when when the, they called and said, Chet will see you, that we're going to walk up and these two huge doors would open and way back at the huge ballroom type place would be a throne and Chet Atkins would be sitting on the throne and say, come on in. And it would be announced by somebody and we'd walk down this huge car. He said, that's the way I thought it was going to be. That he had just a little officer of the desk. You said that um, that you said, uh, Mr. Atkins, uh, could you use an assistant or something like that? Oh yeah. Uh, what was it? I said uh, someday. He said I, I've been. I said I, I've made a few little records around too. You know. I said uh, if you ever need an assistant, I'd, li I'd really like to show you what I. What I can do in the studio, I, I think I'd really be helpful for you. He said, "Well, uh, okay, I'll keep that in mind. You know, the nice. It's, of course, I, you know." And it, years later, I, I I had a really good run. I, I don't know, I, I'd gotten two or three Grammys and a whole string of number ones, fifteen to twenty number one records. And I get this note in the mail. From Chet Atkins. So I opened it up and said, Dear Billy, I think now you can be my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> he was a funny guy. Great guy. Great guy. Very helpful guy, too. Oh, yeah. So you voted the BMI Songwriter of the Century. Yeah. So what, what did you, what, what was it that you looked for 
not only in other people's songs, but in the songs that you wrote yourself. How did you? What What is your? If If you can If you can define it, what What makes a great song? Well, a song that reaches people. A song that you know. If If you're a record producer, you've got to look for a song that you think will make money. That, of course, that's the, always the bottom line. I mean, you do something that you think is great and and, and, and has a, and it doesn't sell, make doesn't make any money for you or the label. Then, then it's, a, it's it's not worth it. But if you just throw out the whole idea of this song has no social redeeming graces, it's it's just a a instrument just to reach out and grab people by the heart. And they'll buy it. That's what you look for, you know. Something that touches people. And so, how, as a producer, <clears throat> how do you define? How do you define a producer? What's a producer to you? A producer is someone who can take a song and put it to, with the right artist. And if you use an arranger, have a, an arranger embellish the, the, the music around the song in order to enhance the way the artist can deliver. It's just like, a, a producer's kind of like a, a jack of all trades. You got to know a little bit about everything and doesn't have to know a whole lot about anything. But the main thing is to have an ear that, that you think that the public has. You have an ear like the public. You can't let anything personal come into it you just gotta say well you know this is this is kind of a kind of a raunchy song or this is you can't I don't think you can let let your personal feelings uh, get in the way of, of what makes a hit record so you just gotta throw it all out the window and go for it go for it when you sign an artist most of the artists that you dealt with all of them seem to have had a something that's not as prevalent today, I don't think, and that's, they all have very unique, or most of them anyway, have very unique voices where you could just hear them sing in line or have a word and know who it was. That's true. Like, I can listen to the radio now, and it could be 40 records played back-to-back -back with women singers, and I can't, I can't pick out who, who they are, except, you know, Dolly or... Tanya Tucker or something like that together. But those are those, that's what I'm talking about, those are some of those unique voices. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, there was there were certain, I don't know that, that producers, and I'm not knocking any of them, I'm just saying that I don't, don't know that producers are um, like one time uh, a critic or whatever you want to call them, you made up a word for your production calling it sherilization. Yeah, that's probably a bad review. Isn't it? Well, it's using strings and all that kind of stuff. And uh, But now you can't necessarily, I don't know anybody, a lot of people used to, oh, you know, if you mention your name to a lot of, especially people that are, that are connoisseurs of music, they all love Cheryl Productions, you know, they're the best producer there was in Nashville, and and uh, but you could listen to to your to your records and tell it was your production, and not, not just a song. I mean, it had it had a a seal of you on it along with. I mean, the song might have been great, but you could still tell that it was your production on it. Yeah, but on the other hand, I got a lot of hate mail from purists saying, "Hey." You're not doing country music. You can't do this. You know, you, you put all those strings on there. You put voice, vocal, uh, vocal groups. You know, why, why can't you just do straight country? So you can't please everybody. You know, you got to do what you think's the right thing to do. Like uh, I, I did a record on Jim and Jesse one time, but and got almost death threats because it was a thing called. There's a diesel on my tail making 90 miles an hour. I said, you have killed this great bluegrass group. It's the biggest thing they ever had. Could have been another jealous producer. <laughs> There's a lot of people, a lot of them out there. That... 
Um, and also, the only comment I got from the label itself on the George Jones, he stopped loving it today, is did you have to put all those violins on there? Yeah. I said, well, yeah. Well, um, according to all the the country countdowns, there's two songs that I've heard to be voted the number one country song of all time. I've heard two different ones. And uh, one of them was Stand By Your Man, and the other one was He Stopped Loving Her Today. Hmm. Well, I can't not agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's That should be answer enough for any criticism. Well, yeah. I never did let criticism bother me too much, you know. It had to bump you out a little bit, though. Carroll County accident when CMA over Stand By Your Man. The producer called me and apologized. It did. He said it embarrassed him. He said, Stand By Your Man should have got it, man. I said, all right. It'll be yesterday's news tomorrow. Well, I, I ask anybody today to sing Carroll County accident for you and then ask him to sing Stand By Your Man. Yeah, that, there's the that's the proof in the pudding there. Yeah. Well, good things tend to last, you know. I think 200 more people have recorded Almost Persuaded. A hundred different people have recorded Stand By Your Man. A lot, a lot of times today, like you hear a hit record, and it goes to number one, and then when it's off the charts, that's it forever. Nobody ever records it. Nobody, you know, nobody ever puts it in their album, you know. Not to mention, how many repackages has, how many gazillion dollars has CBS made off of constantly repackaging those hits in, in different configurations? I think they're still counting. I don't think they know yet. Yeah. I'm happy to say. When you, uh, when you booked um, a session, who was the first, did Emily just know who you wanted to book it or did you or did usually she'd call uh, the leader of the session which it was Jerry Kennedy for a long time and Jerry got busy and then I used Pete Drake just call them they, they knew who to get they'd call all the other people unless you specifically said I w also I want a harmonica and I want a, I want a trumpet or uh, be sure I, I want a xylophone or something for a particular song they got this the regular good crew Nashville's full of good musicians. What was your, um, what was, like, most of the time, um, who was your drummer that you used? Well, for a long time, it was Buddy Harmon. And then uh, turned into Jerry Kerrigan. And uh, then I used different, you know, about the, then I was kind of got, uh, got ready to leave, you know, so I, once I left, it didn't make much difference who I got. And I kind of burned out, you know. Uh, bass players, was it? Bob Moore was first. And uh, in the old days, it was always Bob. And uh, Didn't you use Strelecki a lot? Henry Strelecki used him a lot. Henry was good. Did you ever use a, a Charlie McCoy on bass? No, not on bass. Just harmonica? I always used him in harmonica, yeah. One time I, I walked in, I was looking for somebody, I happened to walk into a session. I, I hate to go into other people's sessions, so I just stood at the door. And uh, Charlie McCoy had his car keys out, and he was playing his keys up in front of a mic, like a little cymbal. That, that was part of the record. His car keys were, that was his instrument on that one particular song. I thought that was pretty classic. Um, keyboards? Pig. Larry Butler, Bill Purcell. Larry Butler? Yeah, Larry's good. Great pick, pick. keyboard player. And then uh, he used to use, I guess, Bobby Wood on Bobby Wood on electric on uh, Rhodes or Rhodes, yeah, or or a regular piano or, or acoustic. Uh, guitar players that you like? Well, it's always Jerry Kennedy, uh, Ray Edinson. Uh, 
it's strange. This is this, this is a guitar town. I can't think of over a couple of them, but there's a bunch of them out there. Billy, oh. Billy um, Sanford. When you had when you started getting like huge amounts of press, uh, you had people call you from outside of Nashville wanting you to produce them. Yeah. Did you ever do any of that? Yeah, nothing really. You know, some of them did pretty good. Like, like I, I, I do people. Like Andy Williams, and Bobby Fenton. What'd you do, with Bobby Fenton? Uh, just as much as ever was a big hit for him. We did a few things. Bob Bob Moore produced him up to. He, he did uh, Blue Velvet, and then they kind of went their separate ways. And, and Bob Moore, the bass player, produced Blue Velvet. No, I'm sorry, Bob Morgan. Bob Moore, I'm sorry. Okay. And uh, and so we cut we cut a few hits. Uh, I love how you love me, and. Uh, just as much as ever. I heard, did Barbara Streisand? No. Did She didn't ask you to produce her or something? No, you did. No, thank God. <laughs> uh, I produced almost everybody on the Mayor Bear set. It was Andy Griffith, Jim Neighbors. They, they were a lot of fun. We didn't sell a whole lot of records. I sold quite a few with Andy, Andy Williams, though. But we, had, uh, we had fun. Um, Elvis Costello. Oh yes, Elvis. We did an album, did real good. He was uh, he was in Studio B one time. I'd never met him, but I knew his music and I didn't like it at all. Then uh, Bonnie Garner came in, who worked for CBS and the talent. You know, and, uh, and she said, "Elvis Costello's down in Studio B, and he's doing one of your songs." I said, oh, whoa. She said, yeah. And uh, we've been talking, and he'd like to do an album, and maybe he can come up here, maybe you can talk about the thing about doing an album. I said, no way. I'm not producing that guy. I can't stand to hear him sing. And, uh, Didn't you remember seeing him on the sidewalk in England at a convention or something one time? And he was set up on a, a playing out on the sidewalk with a tent or something? Oh, I don't know. It could have been. I, I don't remember that. But anyway, I, I said, tell him to, he needs to find somebody that uh, is more into his thing, you know. She said, well, okay, I'll tell him. But she said, by the way, uh, his last album sold 750,000 copies. I said, well, won't you have him come up here and we'll talk. <laughs> so we came up and we, we had fun. We did an album called Almost Blue. It is a big album. Still, still sells big. That's the only thing we ever did, though. Did it sell a million? I think it did. Yeah. If it didn't, it was close. How'd you, uh, how'd you meet Al Gallico? I don't know. He just around. He had a publishing company in the same building that I had a little when I ran Epic. Merle Kilgore was running the company for him, and he'd come in and. And uh, we'd meet and go to lunch and just we'd sort of hit it off, you know. He was a he was a song man. He loved songs. He could pitch songs. And uh, we just kind of got together and became good friends. Co-publishers. Co-publishers. He was one of the few back in those days. He was one of the few real foreigners that could come into Nashville, and his personality. He was just accepted, you know. Everybody liked him, you know. He called everybody sweetheart and all that, you know. I think Jack Clement dubbed him Cowboy Pastrami, and that was his nickname there for a while. But he got along with everybody; still does. Did um, without without um, I kind of hate to pick somebody, but did, was there a not putting down any of the rest of them? But was there a particular artist that you really just always look forward to producing? Some artists I dreaded producing more than others because it's hard for them to learn songs. Some artists that I that I knew that, that would be a pleasure to produce people like Tammy and, and 
David Houston, pe people that would go out and work and learn the, learn the songs, and, and you wouldn't have to just ram, ram it down their throats and beat them up with it, you know. They're, yeah, I enjoy producing some, some more than others. Um, Ray Charles? How was that? It was okay. Ray's kind of, it was kind of the immovable force meeting the irresistible object and all that type of thing. We both were very strong-willed and uh, we kind of got loggerheads a couple of times, but we, we worked it out. Cut a, cut a nice album, it did real good. Um, Johnny the Cash. most talented, Ray Charles, of course, that goes without saying, is the most talented, incredible person ever sat down in front of a microphone. Johnny Cash? He's Johnny Cash, he's like John Wayne. You know, he's on, off, he's always the same. And we, we made some records and it, it was fine. We were both kind of getting out of the mainstream by the time we were making records. But you know, he's one of those larger than life creatures. He walks in and just, his presence just fills the room, you know. So he's always kind of in awe of, some, of Johnny Cash. When, uh, you know, now the studios that are, the record labels don't have that I know of, they don't have in-house studios like they did when you were at CBS. Yeah. Do you think that's a negative? Do you think? I don't know. Uh, I did it first. Uh, I, I really hate the, hate what they did to Studio B. They demolished it. They should have turned it into a museum. Uh, I think it's just an economic thing to to book studios outside and not have to maintain, carry on, and worry with the paying engineers and buying all the latest equipment. I think they just got got rid of that, which I agree with. Let studio people own studios and record people own record companies. You didn't kind of feel like though that by having that in the in the same building with you that it Oh it's very handy. It, it attracted yeah. creative people that uh, it did to a point, yeah. Um, like, you know, I don't know you know like, Christopherson sweeping, coming there just to be around the studio to sweep the floors and stuff. Chris was a good janitor. <laughs> good janitor. Do you remember him being a janitor? Yeah, he had to clean my office. No kid. Yeah. What did you did you think he had it or did you know or? I didn't know. You know, we we never did get into that end of it. What about Willie? Willie Nelson. What can you say? I never did produce Willie except. Seven Spanish Angels. Yeah, the duet with Ray Charles and duets around. I did duets with him and George Jones and stuff like that. But you were the record. You were the executive with the label at the time when when Stardust came out. Yeah, yeah. And what, I mean, that was supposedly a pretty radical production for an album at the time. Well, it, it it was, but I was getting more and more out of the picture then. But back back when I was running the thing over there, Willie cut this album on his own. And uh, he wanted us to pick it up. And Bruce Lundball was head of the, com of the company in New York. And he got a copy of it. He called me and said, this Willie Nelson thing is terrible. I said, yeah, you're right. He said, uh, do, you, do you want to pick it up or what? I said, he only wants 17000 for it. I mean, that's like 17 cents today. Redheaded Stranger album, and we put it out, and it became a total big smash. And we were all wrong except Willie. I think that's the only mistake I ever made. <laughs> no, your biggest one was when I walked in. <laughs> and you, I'm Billy Cheryl. <laughs> um, so, is there anybody that you ever wanted to produce that you? Yeah, Patsy Cline. Um, uh, also, uh, Mel Torme. I, you know, pe people that just, their voices and their inflections just get to you. 
there are a couple of people I always wanted to meet. I met Patsy. I never met Mel Torme. Uh, did you ever work with Sinatra? No, I never did. I met him. You knew him. Met him a few times. Yeah. I don't think he, I don't think I could help him do anything. I don't. I, I don't think. I know. I don't think he. I. I can't imagine him doing anything contrapositive or anything like that. You know, I never could. He was just too, too far the other way. Um, when you got to town, it was so everything was so much different then. You could, like you said, you just you go out and you see somebody and you go, hey, come in tomorrow, sign a contract. That was it. It wasn't a committee. It wasn't. It wasn't lawyers. It was just. No, it's very simple. A lot of fun too. Now. They come as a whole package, you know. Like the, their managers, they got where you where you going to tour. The label's got to uh, work with the with with the booking people and, and all integrated into the record. It's it's just a big complicated mess now. I I I guess it's not a complicated mess if you like it, but it's just something that. I never could get into, so that's the reason I sort of burned out quicker, kind of ease out of the picture, as a, a dinosaur. Um, you know, Noro, when I interviewed Noro, he said that, that those of us who came here in the 60s, 70s, and part of the 80s, he felt were the luckiest people in the world. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. That's that's when the music business was most fun. That's when singers sang, producers produced, writers wrote songs, and promotion people promoted them, and then everybody has got together later, big happy family, and had a party. What are you most proud of that you accomplished as in the music profession? Writing, producing, or I can't put my finger on anything. Uh, I've always felt that I never really had a job because I enjoyed what I did so much. And if I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. You know, record producing was great fun to me. And songwriting, with, I, I was more of a co-writer. I, I, I love to bounce ideas off of other guys and they bounce them off of me. That was fun. We stay up all night, write songs. And uh, I, I can't put my finger on anything that's more important or more more fun than the other. You think that co-writing, one of the things that's fun about co-writing, other than you you do have that capability if you with a with a writer of equal talent, so to speak, um, that it gives you somebody to share the same interest with that it has the same desire for something to make it as you do because you both both have equal well I, well, I think co-writing is so important because if songwriters, the ones I know, including me, they're, 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 they're not really sure that the, anything they've done is any good. If you write a song all by yourself, you think, well, I don't know whether this is any good or not because, you know, I don't have any other opinions on it. But if you co-write a song with some other guy and you like, you're liking what he's doing or he's liking what you're doing, you're doing then, then it becomes fun, and, and, and you're not as uh, as apt to. Uh, what's the word? You're not uh, confident that you're more confident if you co-write that the song's good than if you write all by yourself. Of course, if you write one all by yourself and it does good, then then, then your confidence level raises up there for a while. Yeah. Did any of that make sense? Yeah. You got somebody to drag down with you if it's fine. Exactly. <laughs> drag them right down in the mud and blame them. Um, what do you? What's What's your opinion of Pig? Musically, Pig Robbins is is phenomenal. He's you can play him a song one time, twice at the most, and it's got a whole bunch of chords in it, and, and he. He knows it, and he remembers everything. He, 
and you show him something you want to, want done, and he'll do it. Only he'll do it a lot better than you can. And he's he's one of the best musicians I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, what about Bob Moore, bass player? Bob is the, the best there is. I mean, you just don't you don't get any better, than Bob Moore. Uh, Pete Drake. Pete Drake was the most commercial steel player that, that I'd ever worked with. There's, there's some great steel players and some steel players that can probably play circles around Pete mechanically. But just to make licks on a steel guitar to enhance the record and make the artist sound good without getting in their way, uh, Pete was the best. Do you think that that's what made him a good producer as well, knowing what not to do or or to cut it off? No, I, I don't think so. I, th I think a good producer is just somebody that, I mean, there, there are great producers out there that can't hum a tune. It's just a producer is just somebody that knows what they think is commercial. Whether it's technically right or not, doesn't matter to them. It used to bother me a long time ago if I hear one little off chord or somebody a little flat in the vocal group or a guitar not quite in tune. Now stuff like, or not now, but like before I finally quit, that just rolled right off of me like water off a duck's back. It wouldn't bother me. I, I got all kind of records out there that became hits with all kind of mistakes in them. Really? Yeah. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't, when you hear them, it doesn't bother you, or do you, nobody else hears them, or you just mix them out? Or? No, I've, I, I did a record one time on uh, David Allen Cole. One of the one of the musicians, right in the middle of the record, moved and the chair squeaked real bad. And I couldn't get it out. It's on all kind of mics, so we just left it in there. And the, did anybody ever say anything to you about it? Yeah, some musicians and other people. It, the song was about Hank Williams, and uh, they said, "Well, that's probably Hank's ghost rattling that chair around." That's not, you're not. That's not that one. The ride was the ride. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That was the ride. David Allen Coe. That was probably his biggest record, wasn't it, as a, as a performer? I think... Or was, uh, it, or was it, you never call me by your name? You never call me by your name, my my name. What was it? You never even call me... By my name. Yeah. That was probably his biggest. That was before I ever met him. And, uh, Did he ever get over you cutting the song that he wrote, Take His Job and Shove It on Paycheck and not him? If he did, if he didn't, he didn't say anything about it. So he knew Paycheck did a tremendous job on it. That was one of those marriages that you talk about. That that was just the, there was nobody else really that could have done that, was it? It was just made for Paycheck. And 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 one of the uh, one of the uh, biggest records David Allen Coe ever had with me, that he didn't even write it, and it, and it, it didn't even sound like his type of song. But we did it called Mona Lisa Lost Her Smile, and it was it was the number one record. He had a great guitar player with him. Remember Warren Haynes? Yeah. And he ended up, he's had a band now called Government Mule he's had for a long time, but he ended up, he's one of the Allman Brothers. And oh, I didn't know that. He's been playing with them for years and years and years. And, I, you know, that was another thing. I was, all, the, all of those artists had, had um, that you had, had images. Mm -hmm. I mean, Co. I mean, uh, had the prison image or the rumor he had killed somebody or something. I don't, I don't know, know whether that was a rumor or not. Oh, really? <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, Paycheck, that one definitely was not a rumor about him. No. And, uh, and then George, you know, I mean, and, uh, matter of fact, George not showing up is how, uh, is how Glenn Sutton ended up with a session that you had booked for George that he cut Rose Garden. Correct. I think that I think that was music. That's where you got the pickers. I think that's what that's true. I think that's true. Well, um, really, I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, appreciate everything you did for me too. Yeah. Well, too bad good ones and bad ones were on the A side, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it worked out the way it's supposed to. Well, I hope your museum becomes a tremendous success, and I'm sure it will be. 
musicians are the unsung heroes of the record business. And they deserve it. All the accolades you can heap on. Well, we're uh, we're going to touch on some producers too. Producers and engineers and songwriters eventually, I expect. Well, I can go for that. I'm done. Can't wait to see your place.